continue to order. Uh, first order of business is the minutes. Um, do I have a motion? Second. 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 Okay. <laughs> okay, are there any corrections on, on the minutes? Okay. Um, all those in favor of the minutes as presented, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, minutes are accepted and presented. Uh, next article is Article 29, the uh, revaluation. Uh, so if uh, who's ever going to speak, but, uh, speak to uh, how much do you want, what do you want it for? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mary Winstanley O'Connor from the Board of Assessors. Um, presently, we have $24,000 in the revaluation account. Uh, however, as you know, we have to use $9,000 of those funds uh, to pay the um, assistant data collectors uh, sick leave and vacation buy-in. So that will leave us $15,000. Uh, for fiscal year 16, that's a statistical update. You know, we have to do revals every three years. Um, two of the three year revals are statistical. The, the third one that comes in the ninth year is a full blown measure and list valuation. That's the expensive one. Uh, the one that we're going to be doing for fiscal year 2016, uh, we believe that in addition to the 15 that we have in the reval account, we'll need another $10,000. Okay, so, so we're looking for another 10. You're requesting $10,000. That's correct. Okay. And that will be the work for fiscal 2015. Correct. Um, and we were also going to plan to come to you at some point uh, with a plan. I think uh, Mr. Foskett suggested it, that we kind of amortize the larger reval, the nine-year reval, so that it's not such a big number in the year fiscal year before. So um, we, will, we will put something together in that respect. But that's not for this fiscal year. Okay, so the request is $10,000 for revaluation work to be done in 2015. Uh, are there any questions? No comments? Okay, uh, Dick? I have a question, not on the reval, but on the session. Uh, the housing authority is not assessed, is that correct? Your property? Um, just, you mean the properties that they're buying? No, are, no, the housing and the, yeah, the one down on uh, East Island. Oh, you mean the public housing? Yeah. I, I don't know, they're not. That's they're, public housing. They're not, they're, That's correct, right? Public housing. Public housing is not assessed. Correct. Not on the factual All right, how about cup, uh, out in housing? Property? That's what I thought you were going to Mr. Okay. Um, they, the properties that uh, the Allen Housing Corporation purchased, are they? Some, some of them are on the tax rate, What's that? If they get a 25% rate, I'm not sure I have to go They're not totally off of the tax rate. Oh, right. But they get a reduction. They get a reduction. You, you think it's 25% of the... I, I have to. Can you get back to us and let us know? Thank you. Well, is that... Is that does, uh, does all the towns do 25% or is it or just Donlington has decided to do that? There was a significant amount of discussion a few years ago when the housing corporation started to buy up the properties about them coming off the tax roll, so there was negotiation over it. They still do a good job. Okay, are there any other questions? Just for curiosity, is the uh, uh, housing authority pay anything in lieu of taxes? No, I don't believe so. The housing authority, no. no. You mean like a pilot? No. I thought they made it. I thought they paid. I thought they paid some type of a, uh, like a donation or something to the town. The housing authority. Yeah. I don't the public so. housing authority. No, I don't. Not that I'm aware of. Hey, John can check into that though. Yeah. Can you check that? So the, and follow up on that. The town doesn't give them any money to run their program. Is that right? Yes, it does. Well, are you talking about the housing corporation or the no, housing? No, the housing. Because the Arlington Housing, housing Authority. Does the town give the housing authority any money? I can't answer that. They get some under CBG. They did over, what, all their water heaters or something a couple of years ago? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
No, the lead. They deleaded the place. Charlie, do you have a? Yeah, we, we pay a substantial amount of uh, their pension yeah. in the uh, annual contribution to the pension fund. Mm -hmm. Plus, public works and public, public safety works. services. Yes. So they get quite a bit. For free. Okay, are there any other questions for the assessors? No complaining about your own assessment. I didn't get her name. She did this for me. Okay, so your question is for ten thousand dollars for next year. Uh, thank you very much. We appreciate it. Thank you all. She works for the assessor. So she works for the assessor. Okay. She'll be there. Very, very, very. Very. Okay, okay, the uh, next order of business is going to be the uh, capital plan. No, she's elected. And she's elected. then after that, hopefully, we can get through a lot more budgets. I wrote uh, 15. So are you ready to start presenting? Okay, uh, turn it over to Charlie Foskett, Chairman of the Capital Budget Committee. Charlie? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, you all should have a document that has a picture of Thompson School, the Thompson School in front of it. And this is our traditional uh, approach to presenting to the Finance Committee. Just to uh, make some introductions, the people that are here from the Capital Planning Committee tonight are uh, Mike Booten, who's right here. Um, He's uh, standing in for Andrew Flanagan. <laughs> Apparently, I injudiciously scheduled this meeting for a day that Andrew was out of town. And I publicly apologize to him for that. But I know that Mike will do a great job. Uh, myself, Diane Johnson from the school department, our chief financial officer, Tony Lionetta, uh, Paul Olson, and uh, Barbara Thornton, and Brian Reary, who's the, who's the uh, riderless horse there, horse there in the middle. <laughs> We're trusting that he'll be there. So these are all members of the uh, Capital Planning Committee. Uh, on page three of your package, there's a little uh, a short agenda. And just to mention that there are a couple of other members of the committee that are not here tonight. Uh, and that's Steve Andrew, who is a citizen appointee, and uh, Ruth Lewis, the, the town controller. From page five, You'll see how, how we're organized. And it's uh, something we actually copied from the Finance Committee, setting up subcommittees that focus on uh, particular areas of expertise, and so that we have some institutional knowledge and uh, familiarity with the different budget. Oh, let me introduce over here. Uh, Brian Berry, Vice Chairman. Thank you. So, um, Tony Lynette and Paul Olson handle uh, all of the public works uh, departments. And Barbara and Ruth Lewis handle uh, town manager, education, selectmen, et cetera, as you can see in the chart. Andrew the, uh, Flanagan and Steve Andrew and I do the finance sectors. And Diane Johnson and Brian Rarick handle community safety.
So um, tonight uh, we're going to just give, say a couple of words. Many of you have heard this before, but why we why we bother to do capital planning, what the the value of it is, and then uh, discuss some of the some of the major issues that we're facing this year as a town, and uh, and then the, the budgets themselves. On page seven, there's a summary about a summary of why we why the capital planning committee exists. This capital planning committee was organized around 1985 and 1986 by John Billifer, who was then the treasurer of the town. And um, basically, to try to get away from some of the problems that we had at town meeting uh, in the early days, I think uh, some of you may remember we would have these great discussions for hours on end about you know, adding a new selectric typewriter or something like that to the, in the town budget. All these things came out as individual items in, in the warrant. And the capital plan tried to collect all these things together, put in a five-year planning horizon, and most importantly, set uh, <coughs> expectations for uh, managers in the town as to when they could expect to get their uh, capital uh, items uh, financed, and uh, and also to make to provide a mechanism where <coughs> town meeting could work more efficiently and actually meet the expectations that the various department managers might have. So we've, we've succeeded in this method in reducing a lot of the uncertainty in acquiring capital assets. There are some, like school buildings, for example, very large assets that we can't pay for <coughs> inside the envelope of uh, the limitations of Proposition 2 and a half, in which we have to often, uh, not often, but occasionally go to the voters for debt exclusion. And there's, a, you know, there's always a big level of uncertainty in in that, but we managed outside of a few of those items to fit these items into the long range capital plan. And eventually, according to a set of priorities that we have, uh, the town meeting can tend to uh, finance these things. The, uh, the practices that we follow are on uh, page eight. So we have a, a five year planning process, five year planning horizon. And the first year of the plan is always the capital budget, so you'll see that in the back of this packet that you have. We adjust the non-exempt non spending, and just to refresh everybody's memory, <coughs> the non-exempt budget is the budget that we spend 99.9% .9 of our time on a town meeting every year. The exempt budget is, is either uh, votes of an override or votes of a debt exclusion, which allows financing beyond the limitations of Proposition 2.5. We attempt to forecast the future budgets so that we can effectively uh, plan these capital expenditures. And this is, this is a lot easier because in 2005, the town adopted a long range planning program. So the town and the capital planning committee and the finance committee are all working off the same five year total uh, revenue plan. Um, the capital planning committee has had about 28 years of successful capital planning within the budget. Uh, that means that our budget was approved in all those years, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think without any changes. And uh, I think most of the time it was unanimous. So, so we've been somewhat successful in this process. And the, the key is that um, the, the Finance Committee and the town meeting members um, you know, know four years ahead of time what we're asking for. For the most part, things change. But, but there's a certain, certain level of, of uh, consistency there. And, and hopefully not too many surprises. Um, the requests from the town and school side are also made, since we have this long range planning process, when they make these capital requests, they know that they have to try to fit their requests inside the capital budget because if they don't, it's gonna put additional pressure on their operating budgets. Um, the 5% number, uh, if I remember correctly, came out of a deal between John Billifer and the chairman of the finance committee at that time, Bob O'Neill. I don't know how much intellectual effort went into it or they just plucked it out of the air, but that was the deal. <laughs> and we've stuck with it ever since, and it seems to have worked. It seems to be the right, uh, right level of spending, at least for the most part. And when we can't stay within that 5%, when we have a big item that's too difficult to manage in the non-exempt capital budget, we declare it a subject for a debt exclusion consideration, and eventually it goes to the voters. 
And you may recall that the entire elementary building rebuilding and renovation campaign went to the voters in a uh, in two debt exclusions. Um, the Otteson rebuild back in the mid '90s was actually accomplished inside the non-exempt capital budget. So, with that background, uh, each each of the members of the committee that are here tonight are going to present different parts of the budget to you for discussion. And we'll start with with Mike Bowden, who will uh, give us the uh, summary of some of the programs that are in progress and how we uh, arrive at the five-year plan and what it, what it looks like at a, at a macro level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, just walking through, uh, walking through the program pro uh, progress right now, um, on the left you see some recent realized benefits from the capital plan projects. Uh, the first is the completed streetlight conversion. Uh, we estimate that this will save over 700,000 kilowatt hours per year. 105,000 uh, savings in electricity costs and 40,000 a year in maintenance costs. Uh, current projections say that we will, with the realized savings, we'll pay back the cost in 4.9 years, and those LED lights have a 10-year warranty on them. Um, we replaced the slate roof on the libraries, uh, the two buildings, 1892 and uh, 1931, on time and under budget. Um, we repaired and reconstructed the town garden wall, uh, the wall along Mass Ave that goes front of the library through town hall. Um, it took longer than expected. Uh, there was more stone that needed to be replaced than was originally anticipated, and that stone came from Illinois, so delays uh, ensued. And the wall now is replaced. The landscaping portion will be finished this spring. Um, moving on to the various roadways and sidewalks portion. Uh, in 2014, uh, we appropriated $410,000 of funds to fulfill the uh, commitment in the last override from 2011. In 2015, we were budgeting $420,000 with $500,000 coming from Chapter 90 funds. Um, that's part of a pavement management program run by the DPW. Uh, for water improvements, we spent $850,000 in 14, 100,000 of which was used in a hybrid replacement program. Sewer improvements, uh, we spent 1.4 million in sewer improvements last year. And the Thompson School, as Charlie alluded to earlier, that was completed on time as well. Um, students entered in the fall, so far it's been a great success. Um, the completed design and construction of the Flor Florence Ave Playground, uh, this project is in its final stages and is expected to be completed this spring. Uh, moving on to those in progress, uh, the community safety building, which we'll hear more about later, uh, we believe now the building is watertight and uh, will be moving into a substantial completion in, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, ongoing water improvements, 15, in 15 we anticipate spending 950000 in water improvements, again including 100000 in the hydro replacement program, uh, $1.3 in sewer. It's important to note in, six, in FY16, the situation will switch slightly. We will begin spending more money on water rather than sewer. Uh, that's because we're in the middle of an administrative consent order from DEP to catch up in the sewer um, area. Roadway and sidewalk, we're continuing our roadway and sidewalk program. We have 190,000 budgeted for sideway ramps, and 125 of which is from CDBG funding. Uh, the rolling stock, we're continuing to uh, replace our um, Fleet. Uh, FY15, we have a snow fighter and a sidewalk flower, or, or some of the <coughs> uh, ticket items that are coming on. The design phase of the central fire station, we have $450,000 appropriated for the de design phase. Um, construction is set to begin in July of this year, and the total project cost um, was projected to be just over $6 million. The master plan, I believe you've heard. About recently, um, we've had several community forums and interviews with residents, staff, property owners, and community leaders. Um, that plan is currently in a phase um, to identify issues, and we expect that uh, the committee will work on recommendations and present to the ARB and town meeting um, next next spring. And then the North Union Spray Park and Kibber Playground is out to bid. That bid is actually closing this Thursday, the 6th. And on the next slide, you'll see um, how we reconcile uh, the, uh, to the town's five-year plan. 
Uh, we'll start with the town budget. And this table here is used to determine the pro forma budget from which we develop the 5% limit used for the capital budget. Uh, so we start with the total town budget in 50, uh, 136 million. And then we take the following adjustments. The water sewer adjustment, which is uh, the MWRA debt shift of 5.5 and change. Um, we adjust for the exempt, exempt debt service for debt payments on existing uh, exempt projects. And then um, the adjustment for enterprise funds are indirect costs associated with those enterprise funds to come to the adjusted pro forma budget of 125,914,613. Uh, and on the next slide, we have uh, a table that illustrates how we get to our 5% max. Um, the first line shows the life of the prior non-exempt debt over the span of this five-year plan. You'll notice the number decrease over the life of the plan as certain projects fall off. The next line is cash. Um, so projects that we don't borrow for. Um, then we have the new non-exempt debt service. You'll notice the first number in 15 is rather small compared to the others. That's because in new borrowing, the first year payments are generally interest only. Brings us to the total non-exempt tax burden of just over seven million dollars, and then we begin to adjust for uh, or make certain adjustments. The first is for the <coughs> enterprise fund. Uh, these funds partially offset the rink debt; so it's approximately fifty percent of the rink debt. Um, adjust for ambulance revolving; these are offsets um, the debt associated with the purchase of ambulances in town. The roadway reconstruction OR 2011, that is part of the override commitment from 2011 <coughs> for the town to spend um, beginning with 400,000 and then adjusted for the 2.5% uh, um, every year. We have committed to roadway construction. Uh, capital carry forward is um, capital balances used to offset the non exempt debt plan. Antenna funds likely, uh, uh, likewise offset the, the plan at least. Revenues come from the lease of town-owned uh, property on which antennas are, are privately leased. Uh, there's one on top of the central fire station, and there's also one on top of the water station at Turkey Hill that's actually state-owned, but we receive a portion of those uh, those uh, that revenue. Those the antenna funds. It's important to note are only able to be uh, used to offset recreation debt. And then we come to the net uh, non-exempt plan in 2015 which is uh, 6.2 and change. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I missed Odyssey for it. Um, the Odyssey, as Charlie mentioned, was the one school in the elementary that was paid for within the confines of the, uh, our, without taking a, a debt exclusion. Um, so that, that is the adjustment that you see here. Uh, the net non-exempt debt plan for 2015 then becomes 6.2. And using the pro forma figure noted on the previous slide, the 5% is uh, 6.2, so we are right at the 5% margin. Thank you, Mike. Charlie, do you want to take questions as we go along? Sure. Mm -hmm. if, yeah. Is there, is there <coughs> any questions on the uh, section we've gone through already? Okay. So, um, we'd like to now move into the uh, discussion part of the uh, presentation, and uh, we're going to review the status of the community safety uh, police project. Uh, with a couple of specific uh, issues. One is the fact that you're all familiar with uh, the fact that it's been delayed and it's been somewhat over budget, and also at the at the request of the police department, we're trying to compress the next several phases. We're about to start the reconstruction of the central fire station. We'd like to give you an update on the Thompson School project that we plastered that nice picture of the Thompson School in the uh, front of the, of the report. And, uh, you know, I feel particularly uh, attached to that because the Capital Planning Committee had an instrumental role in uh, planning the financing, and uh, Tony Lionetta um, from the Capital Planning Committee spent many, many nights working on the uh, Thompson School Building Committee. Uh, helping to make sure that this came out in the right direction. Um, a big issue this year is we're spending a lot more money on on computers uh, in the school system, and uh, Diane's going to talk about that. And then we have some other large expenses to consider, like the Stratton, the high school, and potentially the 
So we'll go through these and some other issues to give you a sense of where we are. And I'd like to turn it over now to Brian. Yeah. Brian's going to talk about the community safety projects. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm actually going to talk about uh, both the fire and police department, the capital budgets in general, but also our two very major um, projects, both of which uh, have, been, have been challenging, which are the Community Safety Building and the Central Fire Station. So first, the Community Safety Building. Uh, just to recap, it was originally planned as a five-phase project. The first phase was uh, dealing with the, uh, the water infiltration problems in the plaza between the state station and the uh, Housing Authority Building. That was completed in 2011 successfully. The second was the building envelope, which is the, the phase of the project that's just being completed now. And the next three phases were planned to spread out over several years and are all interior renovations. So the building envelope phase, as uh, Mike noted, is almost completed at this point. It's nearly a year behind schedule, uh, and it is finally due for substantial completion within the next couple of weeks. It was behind schedule and um, and over original budget, largely because of existing conditions that were, despite the very best efforts on everyone's part, uh, with a lot of forensic work that was done in advance, there were existing conditions from the original construction of the, the building that could not be foreseen and were just you know, unimaginable to the, to the architects and engineers doing the work today. Uh, the, uh, we, we feel that the, the Permanent Town Building Committee committee has done a, a great job of, uh, of controlling the project as best it could, as, as the architect. Um, at this point, the, the, the big picture is that um, in 2010, we gave town meeting an estimate of $8 million for the entire project, complete all phases. Uh, that at this point looks to be 11.5 in total. And that includes the numbers that I'm about to give you. So, Phases three through five, which were scheduled to be done over a period of, uh, of a number of years, um, there's a really strong consensus that the police department has suffered enough and that stretching it out into three more phases and disrupting them three times uh, is really unfair. And there are also some financial advantages in consolidating them. So the plan is to do phases three through five together um, as you see here, the design is budgeted at about $373,000. The construction, which, which will be done uh, in fiscal 15, and the construction at about six point, just under $6.4 million in fiscal 16. Uh, we'll, we'll save some money by accelerating those phases. We'll save some money by not having the contractors mobilized three times as three separate projects. Um, and we'll save some money in repeated disruption to the police department. Uh, uh, there will be some added costs, of course, in, in temporarily relocating within the building, et cetera. Uh, so on the next slide, in, in general for the police department, uh, included in this year's plan is the ongoing renewal of the cruiser fleet. That's on a three-year cycle. Uh, likewise, a very consistent replacement program for their uh, LIDAR and radar units and their body armor. And a personal favorite in this year's plan is uh, a new canine animal, which we had some lively debate about at the Capital Planning Committee, about whether that's a capital item or not. And uh, proved to our satisfaction that it, it is good accounting practice to capitalize trained animals. And, uh, and it costs $10,000 to acquire and train uh, a new canine. The existing dog is uh, getting old. Uh, on the fire department side, the uh, and we also have a challenging uh, construction project underway. But first, there's uh, uh, we've acquired last year, in the year that we're in, a new ambulance in accordance with the plan. We've also had a couple of really nice pieces of news from the fire department this year. We replaced they replaced the chief, I should say, replaced two department vehicles with a combination of money that he saved in acquiring the pumper a year and a half ago and a, uh, a grant that he got from the Mass Emergency Management Agency. Uh, and 
going forward, there's a continuing program of, of replacement of the self-contained breathing apparatus and the protective gear for the firefighters. And we were able to reduce the amount in this year's plan and eliminate it entirely in next year's plan for those two items because uh, a $168,000 grant was uh, obtained from FEMA. And then there's the, the central station. Um, this is uh, not a level of challenge, perhaps, of the Community Safety Building, but a very, very challenging project in an historic building. You'll remember that um, uh, two years ago now, the <coughs> initial phase of that work <coughs> excuse me, was completed on something of an emergency basis, uh, <coughs> making the building weatherproof, repairing the, the masonry and the cornices that were in danger of falling off. Uh, the next phase is the interior renovation, which is budgeted in uh, this coming fiscal year for design and construction, excuse me, design and engineering, uh, and uh, uh, then construction of about $6 million in uh, fiscal 15. Again, uh, the, the costs have risen since the original plan. Uh, the major drivers of that have been the trades, which are uh, pricing in the trades generally is, is up in the last year. Uh, and we've learned a lot more about the building. The Permanent Town Building Committee, that is, has learned a lot more about the building, particularly uh, the slab that supports the trucks on what is not the ground floor. Um, requires much more extensive reinforcement than had originally been been thought. Um, the good news is that we reported last year that there may be a change in the mass building code that would require uh, the building to be reconstructed to a, a level of seismic uh, safety. Um, that it turned out not to be the case. That was not required by the by the final version of the code, uh, which saved us about a, a million dollars. Uh, and so this will be uh, going to bid in uh, uh, in March and April for construction to begin as soon as town meeting closes this year. Well, we might as well, any questions for the one? Sure. Okay. I do. Hi. I, I ask this every year. Um, are the um, respective police and fire chiefs, I don't say happy, but yeah, happy, okay with their the items in here for the capital budget. Yes, there were some things that uh, that we delayed, um, like relatively minor items uh, got shoved out. You know, the right. But let, let me just, just put it on in general, if they were in the room, I think they would say they were happy. Right. Because yes, you know, the way I always look at it, just sort of to clarify, because just sort of distinguish on minor items is, and I mean the last the last year sort of sums it up, right? I mean. I don't have to send every, anybody over a hill into Watertown to chase after people. I don't have to order anyone to chase bank robbers, but I definitely want to make sure that the guy doing it has everything he needs yes. to do it. Yes. So, I mean, from that perspective. From from that perspective, I think both chiefs would uh, would say that they have what they need. Okay. Tom? On the uh, community safety building, Yes, do we have a project manager working for the town overseeing that this time? So Which we one? Yeah. Ooh. Right. Eric Adams is the architect. And, and he has the forensic folks. There's an OPM. There's an OPM, and his name is just escaping me, but we do, yes. He's town patient, or is that part of the architect the, uh, team? No, it's a line of several times. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions, Sean? Right. Can you give me some indication or examples of why forensic work was able to discover some of the kinds of things that were wrong with that building that has to be corrected? Um, <clears throat> I, I can give you my third. Well, Diane's got some of this. I mean, I can give you my my sort of third hand version of some of it. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, they discovered when they opened up the exterior walls that there were there were vents. That were, is this where you were going? The, yeah, yeah. There were there were vents that appeared to ventilate the outside inside of the building to the outside, and there's a vent outside. They weren't connected in the wall. It was that sort of level of thing that that when they opened it up, you know, Simpson, Gubbins, and Hager did the the forensic work, and um, there's nobody better. 
Um, and <clears throat> there were there were just some things that, that were just unimaginably bad around the original construction. These were vents. And, and, and as built that were wrong. So these were vents for air conditioning or something like that? Or was fresh air? Fresh air vents. Fresh air. Yeah. Yeah, so the air was going into the wall and coming out of the air. Doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Yeah, yeah Diane has some other the other one that I found truly horrifying was that the, um, the walls, when they were built at the top, there's a capstone over the top of the wall. It's masonry on both sides. And it was supposed to be flashed appropriately so that when water hit the capstone, it would run out. Instead, the flashing was done in a sheet with a hole drilled through the middle of it to secure the capstone. So the water hit the stone, rolled over the edge, hit the flashing, rolled into the middle of the wall, and down inside the building. I mean, you don't have to be an engineer to know that drilling a hole in the middle of the flashing would it's basically turned into a funnel as a bad call. But they couldn't tell until they got the capstones off and really saw that. So the water, I mean, it, from apocryphally, it's leaked from minute one. And based on that kind of a flashing job, you can see why. So, and you know, of course, there's attendant damage to all the water migrating through the walls and the degradation of various pieces, you know, taking off the brick facing, it had melted into the, the oh, it was a mess. And that's just the ones I can remember. Okay, so anybody else? Any other questions? On the uh, phase one, the uh, plaza, by chance did the housing authority chip in any money for that? Uh, yes, they did. As I recall, it was going to be one Okay, are okay, there any other questions? The next uh, speaker will be Barbara Thorne. She's, the, she's uh, you know, the finance committee has long been remarking about the need for maintenance in the town. Uh, Barbara has been a force in getting the Board of Selectmen to create a maintenance committee under the direction of the town manager. She's been uh, working with that committee. She'll give us an update and then talk a little bit about the uh, planning community development project. Thank you. Uh, yes, we've been talking about it for at least eight years in preparation for this and, and working on the maintenance committee. I looked back through my notes and they were actually went back to about 11 years. But but eight years seems long enough. And in 2012, the selectmen said, okay, we're gonna do it. We have a, an official, <coughs> main, we're gonna adopt an official maintenance plan and policy, and we expect you to report it to a uh, town uh, meeting this year. So this spring is when it's gonna be reported. Uh, we've met a few times. You are represented on the maintenance committee. Take a stand. <laughs> and uh, a quarter of a week more. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, we met a few times. We met most recently last week. I think it was a, a great meeting. We'll move toward presenting a, a an overview document with a policy and some recommendations for the town meeting and some baseline data, some recommendations on software, uh, etc. Is what we will bring to them. the The maintenance discussion that we've had um, will will both identify goals and tasks that we need, address long term planning for upkeep facilities, preventative maintenance, uh, and as well address the short term scheduling problems that we have in the town. Uh, sort of Mark Miano is sort of the official maintenance guy and you need to be able to find him. It often works through DPW, uh, but it's not always clear. And ultimately, we'll need to select some software, and there's not a lot of software, but we're, we've been beating the bushes, and we have a couple of, uh, one good and, and maybe another possible lead for selecting software. The interesting thing that, uh, and I'm gonna uh, paraphrase Diane from our last meeting, there are really three levels of maintaining our facilities, and, and we've, We've uh, invested a lot, as you heard from Mike, and, and we'll hear again, uh, well, as you know, from the fire, police, et cetera, public safety, schools. We've invested a lot in our capital infrastructure in this town. And we have, I think, not that I'm precious, a very good capital planning committee to oversee how that investment is done, how we kind of set it out and get it started. And we have with, with DPW and Mark <coughs> and the people that work in the, the, uh, in the schools and at the town, the custodian level, we have a, a good repair system 
we're missing this middle piece, as, as Diane made this point at our meeting last week. We're missing the maintenance piece. We have a huge investment and we're not maintaining it. One of the challenges that came up as we discussed it last week that we're going to have to deal with is, is not only how much money is it going to cost to maintain it, but first we're going to need to show that we can maintain it and we're going to try and do it with existing money. We're going to try and identify where we're now spending maintenance money. Uh, down the road, we may move towards something that's more like a capital planning model where we ask for peace, but, but we're going to prove the, the need before we ask. Uh, secondly, there's a question about exactly how we decide who is going to get maintenance. Um, I know from, uh, and I'll, I'll talk in a minute about the human services uh, piece, but I know Christine is wondering how she's going to fix up the buildings that are associated with human services, and she thought she sort of was supposed to do it on her own. She wasn't tuned in to going to DPW. Some departments are more uh, comfortable calling on DPW and Mark Miano than others. So we may come up with a uh, DPW-centered model. We may come up with a facility-centered model. We may say it's too soon to say and just kind of muddle through. Um, one thing that just we'll, I'll talk to in a minute about the um, master planning process. When we get the master planning process on public facilities, the people that are studying the town's uh, departments to, in preparation for the public facilities piece of the master plan said that Arlington, compared to other comparable towns, is underinvested in DPW by a significant amount. So, you know, there is, there's hard number evidence for our underinvestment in maintenance in the town. Okay. Do you want me to go move on? Or any questions? Are there any questions? Joe? In this uh, plan that you'll be presenting in the spring, are you going to be talking about the high school? The, the, main, the maintenance of yeah. the high school? No, we're not going to talk about specific buildings. <coughs> the, the maintenance in the high school, I immediately started thinking about the, that's really a, a, a capital, that's more on the capital radar screen right now than on the maintenance radar screen. Did you, was there a question behind that that you? No, no, no. Okay. Alan? Uh, you mentioned underinvestment in the DPW. Were there specific areas of underinvestment? Uh, they, they had a very general number. Um, Tell me, do you remember, it's like 1.8? It's about 100% uh, less than the average. Yeah, yeah. But that, I in broad terms, were there any specific areas of no. the DPW that they felt were, no. could be? They just, they yeah. just looked at, at the number. They did, I think, look at personnel and dollars. Was that like roads or water? Or no. Okay. Some people call that fishes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Stephen, just a question on maintenance, particularly in specifically in the situation, you know, these are one thing about school buildings that the recreation department uses, the gymnasiums, for example, and, and other user groups do. And you know, sometimes it seems to me that in, in Mark is doing the best he can trying to juggle maintenance scheduling, but there are certain facilities that are used so much that they really require annual maintenance and then specifically on the, the recoding the gymnasium floors where Arlington High, which is going to be done this summer, I understand, and the audits that are on in every other year cycle, and those gymnasiums are used all the time. And it seems to me that if there's a way to coordinate both the school, the rec department, and the athletic department uh, at the high school to identify this needs to be done, it's, it's not something that we can think about every other year, but because of the users, because of the fees that are coming in for, for users, that it, it's got to be maintained better because it's that they're revenue sources, but that there's also safety issues. So is there much discussion in between, like just not looking at the jurisdiction of the building, but looking at the, the users to continue that dialogue? Absolutely, you're right, you're right on target. I mean, what we need to identify is that there are these, there are, there are, <coughs> Things that if we gather the right stakeholders around the table 
and meet in a defined process once a year, we can identify those problems. We're not doing this often enough. We need to increase the rotation. The other piece that, that I alluded to with the short-term work order problem are the things that uh, kind of spring up all of a sudden unexpected that are substantial maintenance things. Okay, thank so. you. Okay, are there any other questions? Next on your list, planning and community development. Uh, under review, ongoing projects is is a a new project or relatively new. It's been it's been kind of going on, on in town generally. How many people have been here have been to one of the master plan meetings? Oh, and how many have not? <laughs> <laughs> Overstated, but uh, I think they're doing a great job on on going out, talking to people, getting input. They're break, they've broken down the master plan into subsections. The first one was on long range planning, and that dealt with some very interesting zoning issues uh, for the town, which reflect on what capital planning committee and probably FinCom is also interested in, and that is how much money can given our our square miles of acreage can we get uh, for taxes versus what we need for services. And the next one, which was last week, it says here next Wednesday, but it was last Wednesday, was public facilities and maintenance, uh, excuse me, public facilities and public services. What services do we want uh, and how and what are the facilities that provide those services? including some recreational buildings. There'll be a separate open space meeting. But this, again, was, I think, very interesting for the town. And this is where the, the comparison of the DPW uh, money for com compared to other towns came up. Uh, the the uh, <coughs> housing will be on Wednesday. Those of you, and, and I'm, I'm looking at you, what did, how does that go? <laughs> I expect to see you there. Uh, I'll see if they can change the meeting time. <laughs> for for the, the master planning process. Um, I'm representing the master planning uh, uh, process for the capital planning committee. Who's representing it for income? I don't remember. Okay. And the last we, we had the master planning committee, or the, uh, we had Carol Kowalski before us uh, a couple of weeks ago to go through the whole thing today. I know she was under the impression as of today that I was representing the town. I said, ooh. Uh, parking study for Arlington Center, there will be a meeting tomorrow night on that. I don't know if Mike wants to add anything to it. Um, it it's not, I think it's not just for Arlington Center, but it's for overall uh, for the town. And there are proposed projects that you're going to hear more about on the uh, building improvements for the town rental product properties from Mike in just a minute. And last on, on my list is the 2016 rink plan. Uh, this is something that Tony has been very involved in. It's not a building that is owned by the town. Uh, it will take a lot of maintenance money to improve it. This is not something that the town has traditionally done. Uh, and this ties back to this whole question of a maintenance policy. Are we going to start investing in, in buildings that we use that don't own? Uh, and that the next bullet under there is the policy issue on debt, uh, which is related to the, the example of the uh, town Charlie, did you want to speak on that? Yes. Um. We, in, in the capital plan, you'll see some expenditure. I think it's a million dollars planned in 2016. But I think the word, the, there has to be quotation marks around the plan. Um, the, uh, the, the Ed Burns Memorial Rink, as you know, is, a, is an enterprise fund. So it has to, it's supposed to be paying for its own capital improvements and debt service <coughs> out of the fees. And right now, it looks like uh, 
that it's not going to be able to, to pay to fund those improvements. So there is, uh, there is a policy decision that has to be made by the Board of Selectmen because the state owns that building. And whether or not the town wants to put a million dollars into that building that um, is not going to be paid for out of the fees because Joe Conley says they can't raise the rates anymore. And uh, so that would become a, a direct tax burden on the town competing against uh, other services. When, the, in principle, you know, the, the state could decide to take that for other purposes or whatever in the future. So that, that's uh, not something that we have traditionally done in the town, pay for capital improvements in property that we don't own. And I think that's something that has to be addressed by the Board of uh, Select. Charlie? Does the, um, the state owns the <coughs> rent? Do they own the land? You know? I actually don't know the answer to that. Brian, did you read the I did read the that's, that's the reason for that footnote. Is there any questions on that? Okay, Paul and then Tom. Do we have some kind of contract with the state? Do we, not? we have a lease. It's, and it, uh, the lease, I think, has 15 years or 14 years left. 14. <coughs> And, and we had, in the lease, we had an obligation to do some capital improvements in the building, which we've done. Okay, so, and that's, you see that, uh, Mike mentioned the, the line with the $83,000, which is the money that the rink is paying towards that debt service. And, and so the question is, how much more do we have to put into that? And it's, it competes with the fire station and all of those. But as far as you're saying that the state could take the building back, Presumably, they can't take it back while the lease is still. Presumably, but <laughs> City Hall is City Hall, you know. <laughs> okay, Tom? Charlie might have answered my question just then, but I remember when we signed the lease for those on that committee, we, it was actually a bid among other organizations out of town for that ring. We had to put together a maintenance plan that we guaranteed them we would do certain capital improvements over a certain amount of time. Have we completed that? Yeah. Yes. So we completed that. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Is there any uh, way we could buy it? Or is there? Above my pay grade. No, they, I'm not trying to split, but yeah. uh, the, the state has been very standoffish. Standoffish uh, in that regard. Do we know if we pay a rent?
well, between now and a year from now. The, the amount that we're talking about, remember we said earlier that the idea with the five-year capital plan is to tell people about what's coming in the future. And this is a, a fiscal year, um, 16, I said 16? Yeah, 16. And the next fiscal year is 15. So this is a, a two years away in terms of expenditures. Well, well you know, you all plan to raise the issue at town meeting. I guess would be my question. Oh well, we'll mention it. Yeah. Okay. Right. But it's not. I mean, it's really just the the, the selection will have all this. Joe, Joe seems to be in the, between a rock and a hard place in the sense that he can't raise the race, I and mean, the town is restricting him from raising the. the, 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 the John, I'm, I'm not, without trying to be glib, every department in the town faces constraints like that in some fashion or another. I mean, they have just, just another constraint on the town. I, I understand. But and that's why the Board of Selectmen have to address it. But the rink was a choice on the part of the town. We didn't have to do that. So I agree. We chose to do I agree. But yeah. we, we're there. And right. and that, that's my point. Yeah. Now, if there's, um, let's say for example, it's a million dollars for the work you're talking about here, yeah. and we've got another 10 years left on the, on the lease. Probably 14. 15. So if the million dollars can be amortized or have a useful life of 14 years, that might. It can't, yeah, it can't be longer than 14 years. The bond can't, can't be longer yeah. than the length of the lease. Right. So, but we, we, we've gone through all those calculations. And he's told us that he can't directly finance that out of the, out of the uh, earnings in the enterprise. Okay, so any other questions? Sure. So uh, next, uh, we had a discussion the other night about the town old buildings. And uh, Mike is going to present. Uh, Mike's done a lot of work on this. Uh, there's a, on page 19 of your, your package, there's a summary. Uh, let me turn it over to Mike. So the town owns and operates eight buildings that it uh, operates as a as rental properties. Uh, the first three that I'll talk about are under the Urban Renewal Fund, and those are the Central School, 23 Maple Street, which is right next to the Central School, and the Jefferson Cutter House. Um, as of the end of February, the current balance in the Urban Renewal Fund was uh, just shy of 279000 as you see on the slide. Um, the Central School houses uh, a number of tenants, uh, one of which is our Department of Health and Human Services, uh, it houses two state agency departments and uh, several other organizations. Um, 23 Maple Street is a tenant at will situa uh, situation right now. We expect to go out to bid for a formal lease this year. Um, currently, there's an organization there that serves at risk youth, and, and they've been in that building for some time now. Uh, Jefferson Cutter House, we have no formal leases there. The uh, Chamber of Commerce operates out of there, as well as the, the Dollar Museum. Um, the next two properties uh, both went out to bid this winter. Uh, first is the Gibbs School. This is the uh, former East Arlington Junior High School. Um, it went out to bid this winter. That uh, bidding process is now closed for formal leases. There are five rental spaces in that building, one of which is the gymnasium, which is leased to our recreation department for a flat rate of 15000 every year. Uh, the other four spaces are leased out to a few different organizations. Um, we decided on a three-year lease period because that building has been surplused by the uh, school committee and town meeting only through FY uh, 17, so we were only able to offer as long a lease as uh, three years. We do have a contingency um, extension that pending approval to surplus the building for longer than that, um, an extension can be offered of five years. Uh, the Parmenter School went out to bid, it, it has been surplus for much longer, so we went out with a five-year lease that also begins this um, this July. And the interesting thing about both of these properties is this year we just instituted a capital contribution into the lease agreements. Um, so what we're requiring is, an, at the minimum price, 50 cents a square foot of uh, lease space uh, to help offset capital needs of the building in the future. Um, the other three properties are the Donald Library, the ACMI leases, 
uh, that lease expires at the end of FY16. Ryder Street, uh, which is a former DPW yard, uh, is now leased by Lalacata Landscaping, and uh, that lease expires at the end of 15. And we have the Mount Gilboa House, um, which is currently vacant. Uh, unfortunately, last year in January, the tenant passed away, and we have not been able to fill that building. We expect that um, to go back out to bid this spring, um, and hopefully get someone in place uh, at that point. And the table below shows uh, profit and loss beginning in 11, uh, you have 11, 12, 13, and year date 14. We also included uh, 13's revenue figures for the year, just to give you a snapshot of what, of what those revenues are. All the buildings are projected to show positive cash flow, with the only possible exception being Mount Cabola, because we have started to assume the expenses for that while the building is vacant, but as soon as we get a tenant in there, we, we think that, that will uh, more than cover up those expenses that we're incurring now. I hear the town manager is going to be looking for a new house. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Tom? On, on the Ryder Street property, we don't put any money into that, do we? No, they pay for all of their operating expenses as well. Okay. That's, uh, and so you'll see in the chart um, that for 13, the revenue matches the profit mm -hmm. loss. Paul? Uh, why does the Gibbs have a year to date loss? Uh, currently, uh, mostly because of maintenance costs and, and things uh, associated with plowing right now. But uh, last, this past summer, we lost our um, accounts payable person in the planning department, and we fell behind in billing and collections on utility costs and um, rental payments. And so we've only now filled and have started to recoup some of those losses. Is depreciation taken into account for calculating the profit loss? It is not, um, it, we, in the profit and loss, we do account for capital costs for the, uh, the debt service on projects to some of the buildings. Uh, the urban renewal fund, all the capital costs come out of that fund. We do not borrow any funds for that, uh, for any of those buildings, uh, but depreciation in, in particular. Is there any way that if, instead of going out for this formal bid process from Elkville Bowl, we could turn it over to a real estate broker? Set a rate? I'm not sure how we would, uh, I'd have to check it out the procurement officer on the limitations of 30B in terms of that, we can look into it. It, it just, it, the, the process makes it very difficult to, to go it, through. It, it went out to bid um, last summer, I believe, and we, we didn't receive any prospective bidders or people interested, so. Yeah, I, I think perhaps it's people, uh, you know, because just the amount of money we're, we're talking, maybe what, two, three thousand a month? A month? I think the last lease rate was eighteen hundred a month. So for eighteen hundred dollars a month, it, it, it seems to me if we could, like I said, just turn it over to a real estate agent and let them rent it out. Because how many years are we renting it for? What's the bid? Uh, I'm not sure what the, the most recent one was. Uh, it's usually a three or five year. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, people want to go in and rent and rent it uh, for a year lease and then and then roll it over. It's uh, it, it, it's a very cumbersome process to rent a house. It might be fine for the Gibbs or a building. Yeah, it's a very different um, thing for a tap for a Yeah, if you could check that out, I appreciate it. Okay, are there any other questions? Stephen? Question follow up to the newspaper article uh, earlier this year. The property that the DAV is located, that's a, that's a town owned building as well, isn't it? I believe it is, yes. Okay. Yes. And, and is, there, is there a reason why it's not on the list here? Or? Um, to be honest, I, I don't know much about that, that property. Um, I, can, I can look into it further for you and get information about uh, the cost benefit of that. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. So I'd like to ask Barbara to come back up and uh, tell us about the uh, library and the human services. Another keeper. Uh, the library has uh, three interesting points that I want to bring to your attention. The first is they're moving toward RFID, those are the little <coughs> gadgets that allow them to track more easily where the books are and checking them in. The Fox Library got a, a real a bonus. I don't know how this fell into their lap, but they got $50,000 worth of RFID equipment and processing. So it's, it's virtually free for 
for the Fox Library right now. It's, I believe at this point it's up and running, and that will <coughs> enable them to understand better how much, you, how much, you, how useful it will be <coughs> to invest in RFID for the main library. They are under a considerable amount of pressure from the from the Minuteman Library Network right now to make that investment, even if it doesn't prove immediately cost effective. There's a, there's a multiplier effect around this decision. If they decide uh, to do, to, to participate with the MLN's wishes, there will be big benefits, it's kind of the carrot. But if they decide not to make the investment, there will be a stick. Uh, so they will be, they are leaning very much in favor, even if the dollars <coughs> don't show it to be useful to make the investment in RFID. The second one is okay. the... Uh, comment? Right yeah, there. sure. Uh, I was in the library just the other day, borrowed a book, and the librarian was very excited about this, saying how wonderful she, she thought it was going to be. Just a thought. I think they're, they're assuming that there's going to be some saving on the carpal tunnel syndrome and mm -hmm. other indirect costs. Yeah. Well, the way Ryan explained it, though, you could take a whole stack of books and then yeah. they could not only just be barcoded all together, I mean, read all together, but the decision about where they get shelved is also printed out. The librarian doesn't have to make that decision for each one. Yeah. So it would save a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the the librarian has come to Arlington with a, a with a very, I think, progressive attitude about what a library is, and he sees the library as offering a maker space. and I and I'm not sure if you're on top of the uh, the, the movement in the, our country right now. That's one word, maker space. Maker space. Okay. There we go. You have a representative here <laughs> on top of it. Uh, not even a dash, huh? One word, makerspace. Okay, so makerspace is uh, where people can come and get together and talk and even have the equipment there. And I'm not sure how far Ryan is intending to go, but to, to have a 3D printer, for example, or, or uh, things that they can put together that certainly to make available the opportunity for them to share software and, and negotiate or talk about things that they want to make. Um, and it's, it's, I think, a very exciting thing and very appropriate for Arlington because there are, Arlington, I think, is known for having a lot of inventors and independent workers, uh, independent businesses and artists in town. Uh, the last thing that uh, the library is looking at is more information for the on long-term planning. The library has always been my example of a well-planned uh, department for looking forward at their capital planning needs. They were the first to, I believe, to invest in the on-site insight report, which is one example of a report that says, these are the capital improvements that you need to do on your roof, on your elevators, etc. over time, this year, this year. Uh, that report has run out. They need it updated. The, they also need, for the makerspace projects, uh, some, some space utilization planning. Can I just slide right? Any question on that, or I'm going to slide right into the human services? Yeah. Well, I would like to just comment on any sort of makerspace plans. This, this should not be a cost to the town. This should be a revenue generator for the town, because typically, in any makerspace situation, some some organization rents a big chunk of space and then deals with it on a very interesting and formal way. But it's not something we want the town to be involved in, except providing some space with a rent attached to it. Okay. You didn't mention that. Well, I, I guess I'm making that point. Yeah. This, should, this yeah. should be a revenue generator, not a cost. Okay. Um, how is how would you say we're doing with overall capital funding in the library? I mean, I asked a question because I think for a bunch of years when the budget was getting tighter, the library became a, a quick and easy target for a lot of things, meaning either capital or operating. So I'm just wondering. From my perspective? Yeah. I, I think because they had that report 
uh, they have done very well. They didn't fall behind because every year they were able to say, this is the year that we need to replace the roof. This is the year that we need to replace the elevators. This is the year that we need to replace the stairs. And it was documented and it came with the cost to the Capital Planning Committee and the Capital Plan. And it was always small enough that we could fit it in. I mean, there were big expenses. But I think they've done very well because of that advanced planning. They got way ahead of the five-year plan. Okay. So I, I think they're real model. I, I, I'm glad that the new librarian is talking about different configurations to the library. Uh, I think it's one area that technology is catching up with really quick. I mean, since my wife got her, uh, uh, one of those fancy electronic books, she hasn't had a book in her hand at all. I mean, at what point does a library become replaced with a website? Um, she doesn't go to the library anymore, she goes to Amazon. Uh, and she goes to the library actually too, we download it, but um, you know, at what point did full piles of musty books just are obsolete? Um, I, uh, You're gonna make the librarians cry. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's like what's happening to journalism. Would, you know, is, is Jeff Bezos going to make the Washington Post work or die? Yep. Well, we'll talk about it. Okay. <laughs> but, 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 <laughs> yeah. to, to that, and not to get too far off topic, but the one thing I think the library's done a good job of is sort of reinventing themselves. And I'll get to the one thing I would say is I, I mean, I, I'll be honest, I never go. I don't think I've ever set foot in the Arlington Library. Um, <laughs> but with that being said, with that being said, my wife drops my, my wife drops my five-year-old off at preschool, four days a week at the church two doors down, and then my three-year-old, she drops off there two days, but the two days she doesn't drop them off, they go right into the library. And I hope they have cards. And they what? And I hope they have their own cards. Well, they do, the but they have all, there are all sorts of programs there, and there are all sorts yeah. of cool things, and they spend a few hours, and then they just walk across that small little parking lot, pick them up, and off they go. So, so they've done it, I think they've done it. For books and many things. Um, I feel like the Oscars, the music is playing here. <laughs> uh, health and Human Services. Winterburn Robbins House, et cetera. The renovations uh, issue I mentioned before. This is, a, this is an example of a building that needed to be maintained and Christine was kind of tearing her hair thinking, I don't know who to contract for, I don't know what to do. I'm, and, and she's now brought in Mark Miano and, and DPW, but uh, I'd really like to get that cleaned up. Uh, the, the other thing that I think is notable about Health and Human Services is that Arlington is designated as a food desert. I don't, we all look fairly well fed around this table. I don't know if you knew that, that we were a food desert, but uh, there are a lot of people who don't have money to, to feed themselves and the Human Services Department, which the master planning group said is far more, doing far more and, and using more of the town's resources than comparably sized towns. I wouldn't say it's less efficient. I would say they're they're a mul they're exhibiting a multiplier effect. They raised the money to uh, to do the food pantry, and now they're looking for more space. Uh, they're looking for two to two thousand square feet of space with refrigeration, and uh, doing fundraisers and looking for grants to do that. The senior center also uh, is looking at a change in space, and, and I use the space utilization term for the library as they talk about, as uh, Ryan is talking about how to reconfigure the space in the library for these new uses. Get rid of the books. Uh, the senior center is also looking at ways of attracting young, young seniors. I assume that's like me. Uh, and the space utilization means we, we have a space, forget the walls, how are we going to use that space in a new way? So those are two studies that I'm expecting is going to hit the uh, capital plan in the next year or so. Any questions? Yes. Are, are we a food desert because of our lack of pantry services? No. Mm -hmm. How are we a food desert if we have 
She looks like she knows food. Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of people who need food. Yeah. So, and we, and it's, so it's, not, it's not defined by what food sources, resources are available in the town. It's defined by the income of the people. I, I think that, I think it's more complicated than that. Yeah, actually, okay. I think it's also uh, available of, of affordable. And you may be right. right. There may be a, a factor in that algorithm that says, you know, we've got Whole Foods, but we don't have. Right. We have it, it's the income. It's the percentage of people. It's their the age. It's what food they can afford or how they are how they're able to spend their money. Okay. Where's the food pantry going out right now? Last I remember was by the church. It's it's on Marathon, Street. Marathon Street, the church on Marathon. And, it, and it's a stairs yep. you know, to go down, which right. makes it out of compliance and makes it Yeah. Well, I guess I was going to ask who, who designated the food does it and, and why. It, it, yeah, it's an official. I've heard it, but I have, I was surprised. I hadn't heard it for Arlington, but yeah. you hear about it nationally. I mean, it's a national. Well, here's what food doesn't mean is there, there aren't a lot of, there aren't good places to buy food, so you're buying bread and milk convenience stores. Yeah. But we have many. Yes, we do. Food yes. stores you know, of, of all sorts of different levels. So I, I can't I guess, really uh, answer this question to my satisfaction. It would be impossible to, to, to get to, back to you. To, well, yeah, get back to, you know, who, who designates a place if food doesn't, what the criteria are, which yeah. is a, a link to a website. Yeah, yeah. we'll ask Christine when we meet with her. Okay. You're okay. going to meet with her? Yes. Oh, okay, great. Let me know. Okay. Okay, it, is Robin's house under the uh, historic uh, register? I don't know. I think so. Probably. I think it's probably. Uh, it's renovations would have to. I don't remember that being an address. Exterior. Yeah. Exterior on the interior. But it was the last time it was renovated was a few years ago. Block grant money back in. Yeah. Early 80s, I think. So, okay. so um, the next uh, subject is uh, public works starting with Parks and Recreation, uh, public works directly with uh, Paul Olson, former member of the Finance Committee. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to start with Park and Recreation. Uh, some of the highlights from last year, I think, very important uh, the ADA evaluation that has been awarded uh, to Institute of Human Design. Hopefully that'll be completed very quickly. Florence Avenue Playground uh, was, I think, almost complete before the winter months. Uh, two important uh, additions, North Union Spray Pool and the Hilton Street Playground. Uh, the design is being completed, uh, being advertised a bit. I think in regards to the spray pool at North Union, that hopefully will be up uh, by July 1st. Uh, and hopefully winter will be over by July 1st. Uh, <laughs> uh, this year, I think one of the highlights, I think we're finally going to complete the tennis court uh, process. It's going to be a major uh, renovation where uh, I think the surface is going to be reconstructed, hopefully for a much longer time, as you may or may not know the last, uh, I think, uh, five one tennis court just celebrated their silver anniversary and we wanted to make sure we got to them before their golden anniversary. So uh, hopefully that will uh, take effect uh, fairly quickly and also there will be some side work with the playground of that nature. I'm not sure exactly, uh, but it looks like they're thinking of basically replacing the sand surface with a kind of rubberized surface that hopefully will last longer and be less likely to road during inclement weather. Uh, the last uh, but not least is really uh, we're going to utilize $50,000 to start implementing the recommendations of the uh, ADA study. Any questions or any additional? Okay, we'll move on to I guess the, the public works. Uh, highlights from last year, uh, high school cover, culvert has been completed. Uh, Cemetery water system improvements bid has been completed. Uh, the cemetery expansion has basically been negated, uh, so there will be no action taken on that front. Uh, this year, I think some of the highlights in regards to the <coughs> sidewalk ramp program, 
Uh, we're continuing receiving uh, CDBG funds. I think that will be 125,000. Uh, the town will contribute 65,000 on their own. And obviously, if uh, depending upon what Washington does, the impact on CDBG will obviously the loss of CDBG funds will seriously uh, slow down this this uh, worthwhile program. Uh, we're also pursuing uh, a FEMA grant for Millbrook flooding. Uh, we have to provide 25%, uh, and so we've appropriated 100,000 last year, and FY14, 125 this year, and we'll finish up with 300,000 in FY16. Uh, one issue that came up this year in the capital plan, uh, the Department of Public Works, Mike Rademacher, uh, introduced uh, basically a renovation uh, at the <coughs> town, ha town hall and yard public for public works. Um, there are a number of issues that uh, he feels that the yard itself is terribly inefficient uh, in terms of uh, not automating certain functions and some of these functions that are manually uh, performed with heavy, with the heavy equipment uh, is more dangerous than it should be. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is also a situation where you mentioned trying to get the entire workforce in a single room was impossible at the time where there's just a lot of chopped up rooms, uh, which really makes communication difficult at best. Uh, I think it, it's something that we're going to be exploring. Obviously, the, the design plans take place are scheduled for 2017, so there's going to be some ongoing discussions obviously going forward next year and the year beyond to make sure that we're all in sync in terms of what needs to be done. Um, once again, we're going to renew, uh, moving forward, we're going to re renew uh, the incremental town hall renovations and that is um, my discussions with Mike Rademacher. It's basically the ongoing maintenance that I think Barbara Gordon has alluded to that we really need, this is quite an old building with a lot of issues with it and wear and tear, uh, it just really needs to be done on an ongoing basis and hopefully this will uh, forestall any more uh, damage to the building that we, we should be able to avoid. Uh, last but not least is really the, the enterprise rates are going to be restructured uh, for those uh, who may not be aware of it. Uh, we went to a three-tier water system, uh, and the bills will be started going out shortly that will uh, have the new three-tier system. And going forward in July, the town is going to institute quarterly billing on the real estate. You're going to be in a situation where the people that get their bills in July may have the normal six months, or they may have as little as one month. The ongoing, in terms of the uh, meter replacement program, is uh, $2 million. And uh, as you may know, we did a major renovation on DPW with the uh, automatic collection of water usage. Uh, and that was completed about a year and a half ago. So this is just uh, an ongoing maintenance prog program that uh, is hopefully going to be more efficient and. Uh, more up-to-date information, more accurate information in terms of the water usage of town. Any questions or any? Okay, Joe and Greg. Uh, what happened to, Paul, to the uh, cemetery expansion? I mean, do you know any more? Why? why? Uh, basically, uh, my understanding is talking to the DPW is that um, it, it's, they didn't feel that uh, they either had the necessary funds or that uh, there wasn't the space to simply justify it. As you may know, we're going to, the, the Cemetery Commission has uh, 250,000, I think, for the Columbarium. Uh, and I think there's been a kind of a shift in focus and vision, so to speak. Okay, Greg. On the uh grant for the Millbrook Fund, uh, which location is that to address. That's uh, my understanding. That's the area that, if you start from the old uh, Brigham Center, uh, that parking lot, and it goes up towards uh, that apartment building along Mill Brook, that's the area that it, it's going to address. I think it's going up to 
towards the heights. Which part of the Well, above the high school Yes, it goes beyond that, is my understanding. Dudley Street. Yes. Behind Gold's Gym, yes? Uh, I'm not sure if it's going to go that far, but it's in, it, that's in the general direction. Okay, are there any other questions, Alan? Um, regarding the water, the meter replacement program, what's been the return on the wireless meter replacements? Uh, what we, what we saved, but what it is, what's been the return on investing in those? Um, I don't have a figure in terms of the you know return on investment ROI, but uh, I can tell you that from our observations at the treasurer's office, uh, the accuracy in terms of the water bills has increased dramatically, reducing the number of estimates which usually are very labor intensive in the sense that you have to have repeated interactions with the person who does a whose home does not have the, the accurate information for the water reading. So from a, a, an efficiency standpoint, I think it has improved dramatically. There are some dead spots and occasionally areas where you're not getting the information, but that's something that's very quickly uh, identified in terms of not getting the information, so that there's very quick remedial state steps taken to, to alleviate that situation. So the labor savings, we should be able to put a dollar value on it. I'm just, before we invest another $2 million, it'd be good to know what the return is on that. Uh, I don't think they've calculated in terms of the return on investment in an actual percentage, but we could see if we can figure out that. Yeah, but it's like, I mean, street, when we're replacing the street lights, there's been a very nice return exactly. on doing that. It'd be nice to see the same sort of return on this investment. Okay, so I, Alan asked the question I, I was going to ask, which is, I, I think this is one of our follow-up, I'd love to follow up, but if you remember, there was, when we started this program, I had asked the question a couple years ago, but because when this was pitched to us by the DPW director, not the car, but a prior one, we were told that we were going to have reductions in overtime and costs and you're not going to have to go door to door and blah, blah, blah. And then they started getting put in, or they got put in. When we started, I had asked the question of where the savings was because there was no decrease in the labor budget. And we started getting this sort of zig and zag about, well, we, we, we reassigned the people to do other productive things that they weren't doing, even though I don't know what they weren't doing. And we didn't get a real answer on that. And now we're sort of back getting $2 million more. But like Alan said, we never got an answer for the first million where that went. Charlie? Yeah. Uh, <coughs> that's, a, that's a perennial problem that the Capital Plan Committee has. I have to say, and I'm not, I'm not saying this in a pejorative fashion, but it's very hard in a, uh, in a public entity to quantify a return on investment uh, because there's a couple of things going on. The, you know, the overall cost of labor is going up uh, all the time, but we have a, we have a Proposition 2 and a half limit on what we can spend. So there's constant readjustment. Not here you don't, because it's an enterprise fund. No, we should do, because the selectmen set the rates. They don't raise the rates here to get the same revenue from it. But the, and, and in, in any event, the, the workers that uh, are used in that uh, system are coming from the town side anyway. So it's not, it's not easy to identify those numbers. The other comment I was going to make is about these new water meters. This is also to, to upgrade the water meters. The, the D, DEP? Who is it? Who's the, is it? Is that the water? Uh, the state? We're, 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 under, we're under a consent order to improve ourselves. There's a lot of water meters around the town that, are, that run slow. They have a finite lifetime. So they have to be replaced in order to have accurate water, water meter readings. And that's part of this expenditure as well. Thank you. Carolyn? So not all of the meters have been replaced, which is why we're asking for this, or we're getting different meters? Different meters. So all of the meters were replaced fairly recently, and now we're going to replace them all again? No. Ten, more than 10 years ago. Oh, all right. OK. Some of us just have long memories here. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Do you have a, a, a sense of maybe some of the projects that they're thinking of doing on the town hall in the town hall renovation? Yeah, I tried getting that from Mike Brademacher. He was compiling a list, but since it's not really going to start until FY16, he really hadn't done a lot of hard numbers on it. 
but generally it's it's the small I shouldn't say small 25,000 15,000 type projects that you know it, it's the best you can do and it's the highest priority in terms of preventing further damage or fixing something that's a serious problem. Could you see at some point some of this this type of work being moved over from the capital budget into the maintenance budget? I can see what the maintenance committee says they want to do. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, and then, now we're going to move into some general uh, subjects associated with the schools. And uh, the first thing I wanted to start out with is to talk about the, uh, the you know, the Thompson School that finished uh, this last fall, and uh, the students are now in the school. Um, I just wanted to comment that, in my mind, this is a model project that, saw, you know, was solved in the face of a lot of problems. The, the rebuild uh, debt exclusion, the last one was in 2000. A number of the school budgets, uh, school rebuilding budgets that took place between 2000 and when we did the Thompson were well over budget. So we were, as we got towards the last several schools, we were tightly squeezed on the budget sense. Uh, at one point, the school department wanted to spend 33 or $36 million on this project. We actually got it done for $20 million. And that was primarily through the efforts of uh, Tony Lionetta and the chairman of the finance committee uh, and the capital budget committee that uh, guide, helped guide the school department to come to a um, you know, more reasonable pr approach to this capital expenditure. Even with the at the $20 million level, we didn't have enough money left in the um, debt exclusion authorization to finish that project without going out for another debt exclusion. But through a combination of selling uh, town assets, the Crosby building, and take, using money, using the funds from the non-exempt capital budget, and the, and the state reimbursement and some funds remaining in the debt exclusion, we were able to put together a financial package to get this done. Tony sat on the uh, uh, Thompson School Building Committee, working with the uh, project manager, the architects, the construction people, and the uh, MSBA. Um, and I think that the project was a, was a great success. It came in on time and apparently so far under budget. So um, I'd like to turn it over to Tony to give us the detail of that. Uh, good evening. I'd just like to, I'd like to go back for one second on the, on the meters. The meters we have are 30 years old. They also are not able to calculate the quantity of water the way it should be. It's basically, the minimum they can, they can register is 100 cubic feet. The new meters would be one cubic foot. And as Mike looks at his program on your point of savings, I, can't, I cannot give you a number, but Allican has a lot of unaccounted for water. Uh, about 28% of our water is unaccounted for. And the intent is with these meters and the finer the abilities that it had to get down to a more precise cubic feet measuring, we're looking to try to get that down to a much lower number. So there is a cost savings with these new meters. So I just wanted to. I didn't want to interrupt. I was kind of looking it up and just refreshing myself when you were talking about it. The, uh, okay, the Thompson School, uh, the, the next sheet gives you some statistics on, on the uh, school process. I do think it was a very successful uh, process. I enjoyed being on the committee. I thought the, the school department and uh, Superintendent Brody and Sherry Donovan and Diane were, were great to work with, and I thought we, got, you know, we had a lot of successful uh, discussion through the process. Uh, the school was completed. Uh, the children are back in school this fall. We're currently working on punch list items, and I, don't, I understand these to be not major issues, but there are some, with any new building, there are things which have to be addressed. Most of them, hopefully, being addressed over the next month or so. There will be some work done this spring or the summer on the outside of the building. We can't really do that right now. But the intent is for uh, the, uh, the punch list items to be addressed. And uh, we are holding $130,000 in, in security to make sure the punch list items and, and the outside work get done. And uh, all indications, I did check in with uh, Superintendent Super Super Brody and uh, Sherry Donovan. And it looks like they're, they're getting resolved. The contract is there, he's present, he's getting things 
getting things done. The final construction number was just over 15 million. It was bid at 14 million 657. So we had change orders in the amount of $473,000, which is about 3.2%. I also would say that some of that 4.3, uh, $473,000 was for things that, a couple of items that we had as an all additive bid, and we decided because of the bid to bring back in. So that became a change order. Uh, we also had a, a planned change order for a curing of the, the concrete floors, which we had to do. So even though we're showing $473,000 in change orders, a good part of that was for planned and changes. So I have my hats off to the architect, uh, HMFH, and uh, we did have an OPM on the project, uh, PMA. It sounds like an alphabet, but I, I don't know what PMA or HMFH means, but uh, they did a very good job. Uh, I, thought, I thought the people we had on, on the consultant side uh, knew their stuff and did a good job. Uh, so we do have a, a balance. Of, uh, in the contingency fund amounting to $409,000. And uh, assuming everything goes according to plan, that would be available for other other, other needs, such as drug. Yes? Do you have any kind of example of things on the punch list, just so we can get some senses? Diane uh, may be a lot you know, there, was a, there was a drain that wasn't drained <laughs> properly uh, that had to be flushed out. Uh, the the outside work, the, the seating, the, the, the right, landscaping, things like uh, the building still operational. Right. And, uh, Thank you. Yes. Okay, John. I, I didn't quite hear what you said about the concrete floors. Can you repeat that? Statement? When they when they pour the concrete floors, you need the moisture content and the floors have to has to be at a certain level before you can apply the tile. All right, so given the time of year we were bidding the project and the aggressive schedule we wanted to hold them to, they had to dry out the floors. We did some testing the first to make sure what the water content, moisture content was. If, it, if we were lucky, it would have been fine. We could have applied the mastic and the tile right on top of it, but we couldn't get the moisture level down. And rather than holding things up, we basically brought in heaters. And, and to extract the moisture out of the slab before we put the tile down. So that, that was the nature of that. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay. okay, just to go to Stratton, the new frontier. Uh, <laughs> our next school project is uh, the Stratton School. This will be the last elementary school we, we need to address. And the way we're approaching this is to we, we don't see this as a, a major project as compared to the other schools. This is more of a rehab, repair. What do we need to do to make the Stratton School have parity with the other schools in town? So the plan basically is to keep the building and what can we do to enhance it? So a working committee has been established by the superintendent, there are a number of us on it. And we're looking at having dialogue with the oh. educators and parents and town officials as what what constitute parity at this Rabbit School. Uh, we're looking at technology. We're looking at the physical plant, uh, how the school is used. Uh, I can tell you some things that have come to mind or come to the forefront thus far are the the media center. If you look at the media center at, at Stratton, it's probably about half the size of the other schools, and, and so we're looking at maybe we should have a larger media center at, at Stratton as a way of getting power. Uh, we have a skeleton of a funding plan. We have 1.25 uh, available from proposed borrowing, similar to what we did on, on Hardy. I mentioned the contingency on Thompson, $400,000. We may need to look at sale of another town asset, similar to what we did with uh, Thompson. And it's a question mark whether MSBA will participate, given the, the kind of project we're talking about here. We certainly will explore that option to try to get some contribution from MSBA, but we're going into it right now, not, not counting it. The plan is to have the parity study, if you will, uh, 
take place uh, the balance of this year and, and come back to capital in, in August and September with some idea of what we feel is required to get to get parity and some cost estimates to do that. So I don't have a number for you right now, but that process is on the way. <laughs> Any questions? I know there was uh, an issue they had. Um, I did a tour after uh, a couple months ago, and they were having an issue with the carpets on the first floor of the uh, classroom room. Mm -hmm. uh, were basically musty, never mm -hmm. Uh So is there is there anything in here to get rid of those carpets and put tile in? Definitely. I think we, you know, we can. It's in the, it's in the capital plan. Okay, for one that we're dealing with. Yes, that's, that would be done prior to the initiation of the system. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Next thing is uh, going to be in high school. And can I also go back to Harvey? I'm talking about Harvey. I mean, uh, uh, Thompson. Tony's also a town representative to the Medman building. Do you pay an extra for that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to give you a, a status report on, on Minuteman, uh, the uh, administration, uh, this district has hired an OPM, Skanska. Skanska is the OPM. They were brought in on board uh, December of 2012. Council Blues is the design team. One of the big issues with Minuteman is the, the student population. There are two numbers that have been floated by the administration and by MSBA. One is 435 students. The other is 800. <coughs> the 435 is really based upon the in-district population. The 800 is an outside number which includes bringing other people into the district or into the school. As you know, there are 16 industry communities. Uh, we have completed the first part of the feasibility study, and we have some numbers as to what the expected cost range is going to be. So they range from $54 million to $160 million. The, the $54 million would be, let's say, looking at the current building and doing what needs to be done to preserve the building update the building, but not expand it, not reprogram it. Basically keep the, same, the space the way it is, but update the heating, the, some, of the, some of the structural work, the windows, the roof, that type of thing. The 160 looks at having 800 students and having a, an entirely new school. And it would be located towards the Lincoln uh, town line, that area there, beyond the, the play field. So kind of west of the play field. So that's the range of options. There are several options in between. Repair and, and add, uh, renovate and add, different combinations, but that's basically the range that we're talking about. Uh, MSBA kind of pushed back on the administration about a month ago and said, listen, we, we've been carrying this along. Uh, we conducted the first part of the feasibility study looking at 435 students and 800 students we really need you to make a decision as to what it's going to be. So a vote was taken <coughs> at the building committee, and uh, the vote was for no more than 800. Be a lot of discussion about how we get to 800 too, and uh, one of the things we are we are asking is how how are we can get to 800, how are we going to get to that number, what communities are going to are going to become part of the district, what vocational schools are maybe going to come into, um, and again, I personally think there's a lot of questions on on that subject of how that's going to happen. The uh, 
There was a revised regional agreement. Charlie's the expert on that. Do you have any questions? <coughs> and as far as the schedule is concerned, uh, kind of laid out what the plan is. We look to have the revised agreement approved between March and June of this year. The team is looking to submit the schematic report by August of this year. Have final schematic design completed by September of next year and then take the project to a vote with the in-district <coughs> communities in June of 2016, after which the final design will then take place. Any, any questions on that? Uh, what's the sequence in terms of the revised agreement versus the decision about funding the new school? How do they how they match yeah, up? Right. In other words, is the present school committee the present is the present formulation going to determine whether or not to build the new school at four hundred to eight hundred or I wish you had the, I wish you could give me the answer to that question. I'm sorry? I wish you could give me the answer to that question. <laughs> you want to take a shot at that? Uh, I think the the answer, John, but your your question was how what's the synchronization between the regional agreement and the new right. building? Okay. In, in, in theory, they're, they're not connected, okay? In theory, um, the, the cities and all the member towns can vote for the new building um, to be built, even under the uh, uh, current agreement. In practice, the town of Arlington has said that they will not support a new building until uh, a revised agreement takes place. And then even after the revised agreement, they revert, reserve judgment on on the exact proposal. I believe that Belmont and Lexington have taken essentially a similar position, and as well as possibly some other towns. But they are uh, legally independent, but politically they're connected. Okay, are there any other questions on it? Okay. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you for all your good work on all those committees. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the, the next has a little bit more to do with the Arlington school system. Uh, Diane is going to tell us about the uh, new, the, we're spending $400,000. 400000 How much? Yeah, 350000 $350,000 of new computers for the school system this year. Um, and uh, Diane's going to tell us some of the rationale for that, and also talk about the impending uh, requirements for um, uh, Arlington High School. Okay, um, the three big stories for the school department, which we'll hear more about when we do our presentation in two weeks from tonight, um, are enrollment growth, uh, the Common Core, and the new park assessment, which is going to replace the MCAS as the standardized assessment in Massachusetts following the national example of the Common Core. In order, um, this year we're, as part of these changes, we're also, as part of the race to the top funding, Massachusetts getting race to the top money, they've, they've implemented a new teacher evaluation system that we are required to participate in. In order to participate in this teacher evaluation system, we've implemented a software called Baseline Edge that allows us to do two things. It allows us to manage the elaborate teacher evaluation system and to use student data analytics so that a teacher can analyze various testings on a student to see where they're strong, where they're weak. They can look at their whole class and see, oh, you know, in a math class, they can see, looks like everybody missed this fraction concept better go back and do it again. Unfortunately, though, many of the teachers' machines are so antiquated that they are unable to utilize the software that we purchased. Um, 280 of the 500 teachers have software that cannot run this baseline edge with the full analytics component in any way that's useful. Many of them also can't use PowerSchool, which is the system we use for keeping track of student attendance data, grades, and such. Um, we have been replacing computers on about a seven-year schedule all along. The Capital Budget Committee has been investing in this, and we've been keeping up with it. But the rate of computer obsolescence has just accelerated over time. 
Also, the demands for what a teacher needs for a computer have changed, baseline edge being the most outstanding example of this. But also, we need technology in the classrooms in a whole different way. This new assessment, the park assessment, will largely be a computerized test, and not only is it on a computer, but it requires the student to demonstrate computer skills, such as highlighting, cutting and pasting. Um, Assistant Superintendent Laura Chesson attended a workshop recently where one of the math questions of, I believe, a third grader was to measure the side of this triangle. And they had to know that there was a ruler tool down here. They had to select it. They had to drag it up. They had to be able to rotate it to go flush with the edge of the triangle. And then they, and then they had to see, based on the four multiple choice answers, what the unit of measurement was best. So if they picked an inch measurement ruler, they'd see that none of the answers work. So they'd have to go back and change it to a centimeter ruler and bring it up and measure it. So this requires not only the analytics that part, the park assessment and the common core are pushing for, but a high degree of technical skill which is using a computer with drag and drop features. And so in order to do this, we feel it's really necessary to get enough technology in the classrooms for all the students to become more proficient. And with that in mind, the other half of our capital budget request for computers is focused on elementary classroom technology at this point. We're going to be able, with this, with this funding, to have one iPad part for each two classrooms. Right now, the Thompson has one-to-one -one computing with, with iPads, but the elementary schools vary greatly in the number of iPad carts we have. With this funding this year, we'll be able to bring it to parity throughout the elementary school, which will allow kids to roll into the middle and high school with equal levels of, we hope, computer technological abilities. Park will be tested, the park exam will be tested this year, I believe, at one of the elementary schools and, and the middle school, but only a few select classrooms and a few grades to just demo the test. It's not entirely clear when the park will absolutely, there'll be an absolute switchover from MCAS to park, but we are planning to go to park next year, which my understanding is currently that you're allowed to be either on MCAS or on park, but if you go with PARC, your test scores don't count against you. And then the year after that, PARC becomes the real deal. So it's, it, it behooves us to be able to move forward with PARC. One of the upsides of the PARC exam versus the MCAS is that it feeds back into the student analytics. And it gives more, not quite real time, but faster time evaluation of where the t students are relatively strong and weak. So that curriculum can be adapted and teaching classroom practice can be shifted in a faster way than is possible with MCAS. Questions on school technology? Okay, Paul and then Bill. Are the uh, computers for the teachers' laptops that they bring home and use working from home also? I believe at the high school they will, it's predominantly the high school where the teachers are the most substandard and I believe we have price for laptops. Okay. Bill? Is there uh, any coordination with the IT on um, the IT department? Yes, in, in the school um, in the school department budget, you'll see that we've added some enhanced funding for another desktop support person and another um, higher end IT support person to help with this rollout and to support the IT infrastructure. We've added a phenomenal number of pieces of IT equipment in the last five years, and we just need more infrastructure in terms of bodies to help that work efficiently. Jane, not not to put you on the spot, but we. We have a lot of new members. Can you explain how town and school IT work, like department-wise? Um, the because they're the, obviously the, but what I meant. With the exception of change. the director, the, yeah. the school IT department, the town IT department, we share a director. Yes. Yes. Well, yeah, I just wanted people to understand that the school has its own. Yes. IT we, we department. We fund our we fund our own personnel, but we share the director. Okay. Are there any other questions, John? Uh, do you have do you have any? Um, knowledge or uh, indication of the security of the combination of software and computer hardware and interconnection, especially in terms of grades and things like that. In other words, su suppose I was a very good uh, senior Oh, software you're concerned student. about someone hacking in hacking or changing in their grades and power grades. Well, that's what it I can't speak to that directly. I do know the Power School is not unique to Arlington. It is a it is a system for grades that's used nationally. So and I, it's web hosted. So I would imagine that I would hope their encryption is fairly sophisticated. It's not a homegrown system by any stretch.
Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay, the high school. Um, as we know that the, there's been an effort in, in Arlington to update all of the schools and the high school is the, the last man standing in terms of waiting for a substantial revision. There was a study in 93 um, that called for a major renovation. Uh, the last major renovation was completed in 1983, so that's been a significant period of time. We've commissioned a study, the school department's commissioned a study from Onsite Insight, which identified $35 million worth of infrastructure <coughs> issues, the vast majority of which need to be done immediately. Um, not surprising when it's been that long since a major upgrade. Um, there's a lot of questions about the facility use, and you know there are some town offices in the school. We share space with the lab collaborative. We have a preschool there that's part of the school department, but not strictly high school. These are all with the administrative offices around the sixth floor. We also have a growing population. We're not seeing it immediately at the high school, though we do expect the high school population to rise about 120 in the next five years. But we expect it to rise significantly more over the next 10 based on our, re our um, continuity rates from elementary school. We have much larger classes of students at the elementary level than we do currently at the middle and high. But as those larger classes roll up, if we continue, if they continue to be retained at the same levels that they have in the historical past, we're looking at a big glut rolling through the, end, the middle school and then into the high school. Also, in the New England uh, NEASC, I don't know what the, I can't remember what the initials stand for right at this minute, um, did an accreditation review of the high school and put us on warning but because of the state of our facilities. Right now, we're at work creating a draft statement of interest for the Massachusetts School Building Authority. We hope to be circulating that draft very shortly. There'll be a presentation at school committee this Thursday night from uh, HMFH, which has done a study to help us identify the programmatic needs of the high school as separate from the on-site inside study, which looked at the physical needs of the high school. So we hope with these two reports, plus the NEAS report, we can really get a complete picture of what the deficiencies are in the current high school. Um, this will not be a small dollar project, though exactly what the scope of it could be at this point is very difficult to determine. And we are, as you know, competing with many other projects in the town that are also worthy and in need of attention and funding. Is the uh, administration going ahead to submit a statement of interest to this spring? We are uh, working on a draft. It will be submitted to school committee and then to the board of selectmen. We must have affirmative votes from both the school committee and the board of selectmen before we can submit. And there'll be also the architects will be presenting to the board of selectmen, I believe on the 10th, um, for hopefully a vote on the 24th. Okay, any questions? I would uh, like to finish the capital uh, presentation and actually vote on that tonight. Uh, so therefore, uh, just for people thinking uh, ahead, I'm suspending the Mary Ronan rule uh, and see if we uh, see if we can wrap it up. So, uh, I'm sorry, who was here? Had a question? No. Okay. Didn't mean to. Thank you. Stephen. On the on-site inside study, could you just give us an idea of what some of the infrastructure that the, the bigger ones are that roofs, um, windows, that are roofs, windows, boilers, floors, uh, electrical system, plumbing, <laughs> ventilation, and, and then I identified all the immediate. Fairly, there's been no there's been no significant electrical updates since the late seventies. Charlie, you know, just you know, given this, and then it's going to be several years before we have anything done at high school in terms of a renovation of the building. What, what's the capital plan for these uh, thoughts on you know, something ca catastrophic happens at the, at the high school? How do we deal with it? We come to the finance committee and ask for a transfer of the reserve fund. If, seriously, uh, we have had a lot of debates about this at the capital planning committee. We have funded some things that we think will survive a renovation. Um, and we've, uh, some of them have been replacements and some of them have been major repairs. 
but we, we are trying to, with co contemplating this program, we're, we're trying to come to a conclusion about what path the school department wants to take before we start digging into that $35 million. Because we could wind up digging into it and then having to pull it out and toss it. Okay, Bill, is there any kind of specificity uh, from the Commonwealth and the state of Massachusetts uh, about what specifically needs to get done if the accreditation is to be upheld? The NEASC report is out on the school department website. If you go to the school website and put NEASC in the search field, it'll bring up the report and you can read it for yourself. They, they are quite clear about some of the deficiencies. Science labs are a big one. Um, toilets are an interesting one. It turns out we're way below state code in the number of toilets we have for the boys and girls. Um, there's just a whole range of things that the building's deficient in. Thank you. Okay, for your intro. That they did put out a, uh, a pamphlet on their recommendations, and it's on the website, but I can't read it. The printing is so small, I, I can't read it. So yeah. if you could do something to... Uh, okay, I'll pass that information yeah. back. Okay. Thank you, Alan. So I'd just like to draw your attention. Uh, you know, the Finance Committee has to keep in mind the cost of these things. And um, on page 30 in the, present, in the book... Uh, there's the the uh, the chart there shows the the way the uh, total exempt debt service is rolling off over the next uh, several years, and there's an inflection point where a s series of prior uh, debt exclusion debt service payment streams end. The first one is around 2018-2019. Uh, you see that the the whole, the whole level of the graph drops, and then the next one is around 2023. So the annual debt service differential between where we are right now in 2023 is about $3 million. And if you um, have an interest payment of 3% and you, act, and you uh, amortize that debt over uh, 30 years, that would give you uh, the ability to pay off about $58, $59 million in capital cost. And that means that if we were to be successful in getting 50% reimbursement from the state, from an MSBA, we would be able, assuming no Minuteman or other things, right, without dramatically increasing the current exempt debt load on the on the taxpayers, to be able to afford something uh, between 100 and 120 million dollars in total capital cost. If the total capital cost were to go beyond that, then the level of exempt debt service that we would be applying to the taxpayers would be higher than the $3 million level that, you, that we're paying in, in the current time frame. So that's just a, a snapshot to give you a sense of, of uh, you know, what sort of financial impact that this uh, project could have on the town. Yes? Uh, a 4% interest rate, they would assume that would have a significant impact on this project or not. Um, let's see. 1% uh, is going to be Three hundred thousand dollars a year. I'm sorry, one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. Fifteen million dollars on the average over the thirty years. So one percent will have a one hundred fifty thousand dollar per year impact. So um, I just wanted to, you know, I've, I've been trying to suggest to the school department to have to th think about this and to the long range planning committee because. Um, Ultimately, we have to go to the taxpayers and ask them to pony up to pay this. And, uh, and the taxpayers have been very supportive in Arlington over the last 20 years of the various school building programs. And um, you know, if we approach it correctly, I'm sure they will be in, in the future. Um, I'm going to ask Mike to give us a one-minute summary of the sentence, and then uh, we'll move on to try to finish this up. Sure. Um, Currently at the same site, uh, seven of the 12 townhouses are under agreement. 37% of the rental units have been leased. Um, the rental units are currently available. Um, and for FY14, Arlington 360 Sims, we have uh, $777,000 coming on uh, through tax revenue. Brightview Assisted Living, we're at $112,000 for a total of $889 and change. Um, that will pay for the 
FY15 debt service, which is only uh, 677,000 and change, and the bond uh, should be retired in FY22, which is probably partially the FY23 um, drop off that term will lead to the previous slide. Thank you. Mike. Okay, so I'm sorry, 2022, it will be retired. That will be the last year. Okay. Um, Charlie, that's on this chart, right? The well, same. it's buried in there. Most of the, the most of the, yeah, yeah, most of the yeah. exempt debt service is really um, from the two rebuild programs. Yeah. The um, uh, over this big issue to ponder because we've been pondering most of these issues during the course of this meeting. You can just take that home, uh, think about it. But what we'd like to the uh, support of the Finance Committee on is the Treasurer's vote uh, to rescind certain uh, uh, authorized but unneeded debt that we have uh, um, voted for in the past but are not going to use. The $10 million item on page 33 was for, uh, we, we voted this town meeting a number of years ago in the hopes that we would get an American Recovery Act uh, shovel-ready grant to build the fire station and we needed the debt authorization that we were going to get the grant. We never got the grant, so the, this particular authorization is no longer useful. In um, the 125,000 for the fire radio station uh, system upgrade was done uh, through the, uh, one of the other, I think it was the Park Circle Fire Station rebuild program, so that's been accomplished and that, that vote isn't needed either. So, Any questions on that? Okay. So then um, it brings us back to the earlier chart. All of these things that we've been discussing that we're asking you to vote for, not including the high school, the Minuteman, the Stratton, well, par partially Stratton, but um, our, our the high school and Minuteman are not contained in the five-year plan at this point. Um, but they're all in this five-year plan, and the five-year plan worked out in detail uh, comes to about 4.97% on the average over the five years. In the back of the package that you have, there are three exhibits. The first one is the, is the uh, detailed budget, the, the uh, capital budget, which is the budget we will request town meeting to vote in, um, for, for fiscal year 2015. The second document is the five-year plan. This includes all of the major items that we've discussed tonight, plus um, you know, things like photocopiers and, and uh, the various rolling stock in the Public Works Department, et cetera, uh, in detail, which you're familiar with from prior uh, capital reports to town meeting and to the Finance Committee. And then the third exhibit is the um, forecast of new debt schedule that is uh, the result of the proposed bonding over the five years, which gets added to the cash expenditure and to the prior debt and comes uh, uh, is what's used in calculation of the, uh, in the calculation of meeting the five percent um, commitment to the, uh, the stay within five percent of the town annual budget. This is a self-governing system because each year we force the budget to meet the five percent in that capital year. So, if prices go up on something two years out and we get there and it's more than 5%, we have to cut something out and push it out. So that's how we keep this budget within 5% every year. And we get to the big items, for example, the high school, we're gonna have to go to the public for that for a debt exclusion. Any questions? Be a test tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> right? Um, this committee, uh, the, the capital planning committee, is the only one that I really see that looks out five years be a, I mean, truly is, pl is planning out five years. Um, as we discussed earlier, uh, I think when the town manager was in, um, in 2019, we're gonna have sort of a budget Armageddon um, that's gonna happen when there's gonna be a $6 million shortfall. How has the capital planning committee looked at that? In the, in, in, no, it's not your problem, but you're the only committee that I really have seen that, I mean, goes out and talks about it and, and plans for it. Right now, we are using the 
long range planning forecast, the, the, the long range forecast that's been developed by the town manager and the long range planning group. And uh, there's an implicit assumption in that plan that the town will be able to accomplish an override or some additional financing uh, at the uh, two th uh, fiscal year uh, 2019, I think it is. Uh, what we have done in the past in the, with the capital budget is as we, get, as we get closer to that date, we reduce the spending. We shift it from cash, from bonding to cash. And, and so that in fact, um, I want to say it was something like three or four years ago when we actually had a shortfall reduction in the operating budget, uh, we actually didn't have to. We didn't have to cut the capital budget because we had planned it lower in anticipation of um, the, the budget reductions that actually did come. Now, whether we'll be clever enough to do that so smoothly this time, we'll have to see in five years. But that's the practice that we followed. Well, I see you guys at the leading edge. I mean, truly, I, I, I see you at the leading edge of, of, of getting there. When you're talking about um, going for a two and a half override for the schools, I think that's going to like have a, a, a devastating effect if two years before that we go for a $25 million operating budget override. I mean, in, 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 I'm not sure the time Actually, at all, but, but that's, a, that's, a, that's the reason for this chart, Brian. That's a very good point. If you look on page... The, the reason I the reason I want would like you to focus on this chart is because if the school project, the high school for example, stays within the parameters of this chart, the high school project is not going to be competing with the override. But in, within the public, I see competing within the override. Not not if the town can turn around and say your taxes are not going to go any higher than they were in 2015. In other words, that this is a this is not this is not the ex not exempt tax. This is the exempt tax and stuff we pay. And so, if, if we can say within a spending envelope, it's not going to be in competition with the overall. If we go above that, then you're you're exactly right. Okay, uh, Jane. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, first, thank you for the presentation. Um, I think I say this every year, but um, I, I think sometimes, you know, you get we get lulled to sleep, right? We 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 come here and we get this we get an excellent presentation from the capital planning committee, and it's thorough and it's well thought out and it's long term and it's thinking and it's structured in such a way that I, I think when I say we get lulled to sleep, we don't appreciate how great this is, really, and I and I really mean that because. You know, what, what's amazing about the capital plan is it, it's really the bedrock of a lot of the way we, you know, our community function, whether it's our schools or our playgrounds or our public safety buildings and, and things like that. And w when you look at a lot of surrounding communities, um, you know, I always look at the neighboring town of my childhood. They, they need to, they, they, they go out and they get overrides for everything like police stations fire stations i mean any you know when i when i always look at arlington it's you know the capital planning and long-term thinking you know I, I feel like you guys talk about not being able to fit a hundred million dollar school in with your capital plan is all oh, we wish we could we really can't but when you look at everything that can go in and support our way of life and our quality of life i mean i think it's it, it's an it's an excellent job it's an amazing job i've always said it's my favorite budget to, to just sit through the presentation of and, and I realized, you know, like I said, I mean, I think you just, we sort of just take it for granted. I mean, it's, it's a ton of work you guys do, and everyone on the committee does an excellent job. You know, I'm always appreciative, and it's the one budget I can support and vote for without any hesitation. So, thank you as always. Thank you, Matt. Now, don't keep that up. Don't want to raise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, oh. Okay, well, now keep in mind, this is what we're going to be voting on. So go to that page for now. But I also wanted to say, in support of the um, Capital Budget Committee, that when we went to the Association of Town Finance Committee, that meeting, we also found out that a lot of towns are now using Arlington's format and process to, for their own 
capital budget committee. Okay, I'll uh, go to page 36. This is the report of Carol, do you want to just go down to it briefly? Okay, so in the, the non-exempt portion, in summary, what we're asking for authorization to spend is $10,593,105 worth of borrowing to, to purchase uh, the various projects and, and acquisitions. We also want authorization to spend $1,554,300 worth of direct cash expenditures, and authorization <coughs> for $5,680,000 from other categories. These include things like uh, you know, water and sewer, uh, enterprise funds, uh, CDBG, uh, state grants, et cetera, that are off the tax base, but the town still needs the authorization to appropriate that money. So that's uh, summarized on the right-hand side in the box in the, at the very top. Okay. Also, um, the town meeting has to authorize the, actually, not only, I think it's required to authorize the, the spending for the prior year's debt service. So, the, so that, uh, in the next box, the non-exempt debt service that was voted in bond authorizations in prior years is 4.62050 million, I'm sorry, $4,662,050 in principal and $966,528 in interest. Now, in addition to that, um, we also have to authorize uh, some spending for different um, enterprise funds for the water and sewer, et cetera. Even though that money's coming not from the taxes, but it's flowing through the town, uh, the town meeting has to authorize that. We make also the corrections. Mike uh, Bowden took you through the um, adjustments for the antenna funds and, and rig payments, et cetera. And then uh, after that, we also have to vote a town meeting authorization of the debt service for prior exempt debt that, we, that the town has voted for and incurred, but that has to be reappropriated each year. So um, when you get to add all those up, you take out the enterprise fund and the MRA, MWRA loan payments, the total tax rate appropriation is $9,918,750 including both non-exempt and exempt expenditures. That will show up, if you remember the finance report from last year and in the capital planning report, that shows up in about a page and a half worth of, uh, of a vote in five sections, in line, line item by line item detail. So that's, that's but this is the net summary of what, what we're asking for. In addition to these, uh, we're asking for the, the um, authorization of, um, of the, the rescission that I mentioned on the earlier page, those two items. And in a separate time, we're gonna ask for um, transfer of money from the lots and grave funds and the um, perpetual care funds. But I think we'll, we'll take that at a different time. Okay, so what we're voting on uh, basically is page 36. Uh, on that. So that is the uh, vote. Do I have a motion on that? So moved. Second? Second. Okay. Questions? Discussion? Paul? Um, so we will not be doing any of this on this at the special town meeting? Oh, that's a good question. The, the, um, according to the Permanent Town Building Committee, uh, I think they will not be ready to uh, take a vote on a hard number at the special town meeting. So. They, while there's a warrant article in there, um, they're, they're not, they won't, won't want to move on that. If that changes, we'll come back to you. We'll have the managers going to be in on Wednesday on the special town meeting articles. Okay, are there any other questions or discussions for the capital uh, vote on page 36? Okay, the motion's been made and seconded for positive action. Uh, for a sort of bottom line, 9918750, but you're basically voting this page. All those in favor, please, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so it's favorable action. Unanimous. 3514. Okay, then if you go to page 33, and Charlie, could you 
get your recommended vote to Gloria yes. as soon as you, know, you can put it together. Okay, on page 33 is the rescinding prior year debt service. Uh, so this is basically prior authorizations that have not been borrowed, not used, not needed. Uh, uh, do I have a motion? Motion. Second? Second. Okay, any questions or discussions? Okay, all those in favor of support of the rescission of these votes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, unanimous, favorable action on 3-5. Gloria, you can just use this exact language. So just copy this right into the vote. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, is there any other questions or comments for the uh, Capital Committee? Alan? This, this is a big question, as much for, for the chair as for the vice chair. In, in other discussions, um, there have been questions about two specific items that could potentially be structures enterprise funds, one being the rescue ambulance service and one being the, all, the building rental program, the revenues. And I guess the question is for the chair is, what, what would be the appropriate um, time or venue to talk about whether or not the, we'd want to recommend either or both of those to become enterprise funds? I think, I think you, you should check with, um, you should have the town manager check with the uh, town council. But we should have the town manager check with the town council. My recollection, I don't know about the ambulance funds, the pros and cons of that. My recollection on the building funds, the building town building, <coughs> is that we, um, when Al Minervini was comptroller, we did run those as a enterprise fund. But some state law prohibited it, and the DOR forces to put the money in the general fund. I don't know whether that's still the current state law or not. Um, the, the difference, the, the one part of that that does operate as an enterprise fund, although it's not an enterprise fund, are those three buildings that are in the urban renewal fund. That's a special type of fund. Arlington's allowed to create those in distressed districts under this special um, redevelopment board act. But, I don't think the other buildings fall into that category. So the first, first question would be to the manager. To the, the manager. The legal question is whether it's possible. To find out if it's possible. Okay, we're going to have him here uh, on uh, Wednesday. Uh, so we'll have plenty of time for him. Um, yes. I, I think I misstated the date for the master plan meeting. I think it is Thursday. <laughs> Careful, guys. I think you're going to take attendance. I think you're going to take attendance. So, as many as people can make it, I think that would be appreciated. Okay, are there any other questions for the Capital Committee? Okay, I'd like to thank you all for coming. We really appreciate your, uh, your work and your time and your effort. Thank you. Now, uh, we had one other vote, we had one other hearing today uh, on Article 29, but I think uh, Charlie is going to be meeting with the assessors, so he asked that we, we put that off. Uh, let, let's just take a look at these votes. Uh, Article 26, I'm going back to the warrant. Let's see if there's anything else we could get rid of. Uh, okay, Article 26 is, is collective bargaining. I talked to the manager. There's a collective bargaining article here, and there's a collective bargaining article in a special town meeting. All the town unions uh, are up uh, June 30th, 2015, except for one. Uh, and the manager would like us to vote on that one union uh, in, under the special. So therefore, there's nothing to really consider under the uh, Article 26 of the annual town meeting. Uh, therefore, we might as well take a no action vote on that. Uh, do I have that motion? So moved. Second. Okay. So move no action on Article 26. 
uh, for collective bargaining again because we're taking that action under the special town meeting. All those in favor of no action on Article 26, we say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, so that's unanimous. 3314. Uh, 27, Carolyn, going to have that uh, the next week or so? Uh, which one? The oh, the reclass? Yes. Okay, so you're working on that. The yeah. budgets, obviously, we're working on. Uh, Article 29, we'll take that when uh, all those, when the assessor budget comes up. Uh, we've done the capital, we've done the rescission. Uh, the water and sewer will be done when Grant, if you, you can make recommendations when you report on that. Uh, Minuteman, we're going to hear on the. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, committees and commissions. Lori, how are we doing there? <laughs> okay, so. Do you want me to do class on Wednesday? Or no, I'm just okay. sort of yeah. a, a, a subtle okay. Okay. urging. I, I'm not going to be here for the first two hours. Well, I think we did. I, I, I'm not the yeah. Yeah. Okay, so on the committees and commissions. Yeah. Scratch that out. <laughs> I'm just looking at last year. Okay, so the Arlington Historic Commission was 2,160. Uh, the Historic District Commissions were 5,100. Capital Planning Committee is zero. Committee on Disability was 3,000. Recycling was 3,000. Human Rights was 4,500. Tourism is 1,775. We've already voted that. Uh, TAC, we voted 15,000. Uh, so it's basically the rest of them. The uh, Human Rights Recycling, uh, Commission Disability, Capital Historic, and Commission from last year uh, on those. So do I have a motion on that? So okay. Second? Second. Okay. So basically, except for TAC and the Arlington Tourism, which we've already voted, we're voting uh, all the rest the same as last year. Um, we also, we also voted Vision 2020. Right. That's right. I'm sorry. 2020. What did we vote? I think it was 3,000. 3, 3,000. That's right. Okay. On the rest of those bills. Excuse me. I'm just a little confused. I thought Article 29 we did vote tonight. 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 But we did we, we heard. We heard Article 29, we didn't vote on it. We, in other words, we had a hearing on it, but we didn't actually vote our recommendation on it. Uh, because the committee that's dealing with the assessors is going to be meeting with them, you know. and they'd like to have a go, come back and vote on it. But we okay. haven't voted on it. Okay. So, well, that's what so the votes we've taken were the uh, capital budget votes. Okay, so is there any, basically all these committees were voting the uh, same as last year, except for the ones we've already voted differently. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, Gloria, got all that? Okay. Uh, okay, celebration, so that's full action. That's huge. Numbers, unanimous. Okay. Uh, let's see what else we can do in the next minute. One minute. 45. Actually, <laughs> I think we've gotten pretty far. It's a good, good night's work. Uh, is there any other business before the committee? Meeting is adjourned.